how do we go to the moon and stay there and go to farther destinations? The vast majority of students that are in college right now have never lived a day where there has not been someone living and working in space. I've never seen a conference with so many representatives from national security space, commercial space, civil space, and the scientific community all kind of converging here at the same time. There are a lot of challenges, that there are a lot of unknown unknowns, that space is hard, and that's why we choose to do it. My experience at Ascend proved two things. One, I made the right decision leaving my job in TV news because space is happening now and we are just entering the third space age and I don't want to miss a thing. Secondly, it's what you know and who you know. And after three days straight of networking in Las Vegas, I now know many more people in the space industry and I wanted to introduce you all to some of them. Of course, we have a lot of excitement about our return to the moon for the first time in over 50 years, but the Ascent Conference touched every aspect of space you can think of. There were over 400 speakers, which is nuts, and about 1,100 people on site. And I talked to not only people who are already established in the space industry. These are, these are all uh, military ribbons. You might see the Major Cupid behind you also has some ribbons uh, on his, and, and each one of them is, is a different uh, decoration. But also students who are on their way to becoming future leaders in the space industry. One of the event coordinators suggested that we do a bingo to kind of break the ice between the professionals uh, and to uh, move away from being shy, especially because we're young and we know that we have to collaborate with the older generation of, of space engineers and businessmen. And so that allowed us, or that allowed me personally to meet so many people here and I got like 50 business cards from it. I will be in Florida for the next Artemis attempt on November 14th. And of course, we talked a lot about Artemis during the Ascend conference. There are over 2000 suppliers for Artemis and I wanted to talk to Jim Free, who develops the architecture and systems for the Artemis One mission. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the EVA suits being developed for both the Moon and Mars. What would some of those differences be between the suits? So we're trying to advance the flexibility from where suits are today. So that, that applies to the to Moon or Mars. Um, to give the crew more access to reach down, uh, get in and out of vehicles. Um, and then we also obviously have to prepare for the dust on the moon and then the, the, uh, the Martian environment as well. So the dust, they're, they're two different environments. So that dust mitigation, as we learned from Apollo, it's, it's very sharp, very glass-like. Um, so we're doing things like covering up the joints, redesigning the joints to be a little bit more dust tolerant. That's prim primarily the things we're attacking. So we're talking about that with the moon specific, but anything different that we're looking at for the Mars specific suits? Well, I, I think the, the uh, temperature environment is going to be different, which is, as you know from the space station suits, how we regulate temperature really goes to the design of the suits. So that with that temperature difference, uh, not quite the same extremes we're going to see on the moon. Um, we're going to have to adapt the, the thermal parts of the suits differently from ours. Two of the most successful videos on my channel are about the future of housing. So I asked Jim what the habitats on the moon could look like. So we're, we're working on a number of different uh, technologies right now to help us. You know, inflatable habitation certainly is something that we've talked about. Our environmental control and life support system is incredibly important to the operation of the uh, uh, of those. So if you think about Mars, it's a logistical nightmare. We, so we have to learn how to recover oxygen from, uh, from the atmosphere so that we don't have to transport oxygen out there for the crew. We're, we're proving some of that out on space station today, actually flying some of the same systems that will fly on Mars, we're testing on space station today. Um, it's also, how do you put habitation so if you look at where we're going on the south pole of the moon, the lighting is very difficult. So where we might land today is we're going to have to land in a different place in two weeks. So we can't just put our habitation in one spot. We almost have to think about distributing across where we're going so that if we don't launch today and we have to go somewhere else in two weeks, we have that habitation system to actually go to. So it's almost like a, a distributed set of camping as opposed to just ending up in one spot. I talked about logistics to Mars being a problem. Logistics to the moon is also challenging. So what we do with the regolith 
um, on, the, on the moon to build habitats is something we should certainly be looking at. I'm really intrigued by these lava tubes that are potentially on the moon where the crew can actually go down into the lava tubes and maybe and eventually in the long term that be the habitation that we start to look at for them. All right, so our Space Technology Mission Directorate it does an excellent job at trying to mature a lot of technologies simultaneously and that's what they've been trying to do with ISRU. I worry about ISRU from the, it's going to take a while to build. So we look at ISRU of how do we take the regolith or what's in the regolith and extract from it uh, water or helium or, or some other metallic uh, substance. But that also takes a lot of power. And you also have to gather all the regolith. So we have to start working on these systems now if we're going to use them in the foreseeable future. And that's really what I want to work with our Space Technology Mission Director around is to figure out what is our best, best path forward so we can start developing it today. How do we get people that are really in the mainstream to kind of wake up and get excited? Yeah, well, I mean, I think you getting the word out, I've had the pleasure of watching some of your stuff and getting the word out is one way. I, I think it's doing missions. You know, if I look at I'll take it out of exploration for a second and say, look at what was done with DART and what excitement that created and the images that come out of James Webb Space Telescope. So I think um, it's, it's going and doing the missions that will get people excited and us telling the story, us in the space industry, of why it's important. Artemis 1 is going to hopefully launch here, uh, our next try on November 14th. And when we can talk and people see that vehicle take off, I think that tells a story that gets down all the way into education. And we start inspiring people just like I got inspired when I was young and saw uh, the space shuttle missions. So I, I think it's, it's demonstrating how the dollars that people invest are paid back to them in, in inspiration or economic viability or science return. I also talked to Lieutenant General Shaw. He is with the United States Space Command, and he talked about the United States Space Force. This is the sixth department of the military created because of threats to our space industry. It was formed because Russia and China are working on orbit anti-satellite capabilities, so we need to be prepared and able to defend. I really loved your kind of, you know, outlook on the third space age so can you just tell people more about that yeah ellie the, the thought i was i was trying to convey was that i, I think we're in a i think we're entering a, a new age for space uh, and, and uh, i call it the third space age and uh very quickly saying though the first space age probably best characterized by the cold war and that was across all sectors of space uh, uh, national security was a big piece of it civil with the apollo program and commercial was just sort of embryonic in the first space age and we we're doing some scientific work and, and then the second age would be probably the end of the cold war till just probably a few years ago where we weren't under threat in space and we kind of did most of our civil activity in low earth orbit with the international space station and and commercial sort of sort of evolved along linear paths uh, but man, in recent years, I think we've entered a whole new new age. We've had nonlinear developments in commercial space with reusable launch and and uh, low Earth or, pro proliferated low Earth orbit constellations that are changing the game. Civil space is going back to the moon, and we're seeing national security challenges in ways we've never seen before that we have to address. And and all of these all of these uh, factors are kind of coming together in a in a conjunction of the space sectors where we're going to have to work together to kind of really work our path through. Right, and it seems like a lot of our younger generation is pretty excited about Space Force. This, that excitement stems from a sense that, hey, there there is a lot going on in space, and it isn't just scientific, and it isn't just commercial. There's a lot, It's cr and I think that sense is what we're seeing in the excitement about it, is, hey, I want to be a part of this somehow, and Space Force might be a way that I can do that, and I think that's true. Right. So we're going to need uh, you know, ter terrific folks of the next generation across all those sectors, but we'll need them in the national security sector, too. I mean, we have Guardians of the Galaxy movie, but what if you could be a real guardian, right? Uh, well, it, it's a reality. <laughs> yeah, we have a space force. Thinking about cybersecurity, this professor wanted to take it a step further, and he actually created a really unique game to teach students and everyday people like you and me how important cybersecurity is right now. Today, I'm going to be running a game called CyberStar. CyberStar is a um, uh, active learning game. It's a real-time strategy game played between players. Uh, the players 
They are states, nation states, and their objective in this game is to become leaders in space power. And how they do that is by um, collecting the most number of satellites that they can within a simulated 10-year period. Uh, the 10 years are represented by uh, plays, uh, rounds of play, and uh, each round uh, a player has the opportunity to buy satellites, but they also have the opportunity to buy anti-satellite mm -hmm. capabilities or cyber capabilities. <laughs> so it's a space power projection game, um, but it's really a game that's meant to instill uh, the importance of cybersecurity in um, space operations. Very interesting and probably just growing more important by the day. Very important, uh, especially today in today's world. Um, as you know, uh, space is a strategic asset um, and it's an important part of the U.S. security strategy and um, there are competitors and agents in the world who would like to be able to reduce our uh, ability and they are investing in ways of uh, asymmetrically, if you will, try and reduce our ability to uh, project space power. One of the way is through anti-satellite ASAT capabilities. Another way is through cyber. The big difference is this. About four or five nations today have ASAT capabilities. All nations have cyber capabilities. Right. ASAT capabilities are very expensive cyber capabilities are not. And this game is meant to accentuate that. Okay. So are you going to have people in the session learn it and play it? Yes. Um, it's got only a few rules. Uh, they can all fit on uh, one screen. And uh, I will go over those rules, but it's not overly complicated. The formal rules are that you buy um, uh, capabilities. You can use those capabilities to attack another player, another nation. You use those capabilities also to build your uh, fleet of satellites, if you will. Again, the objective is to have the most at the end of 10 rounds. While you're not on your turn, then you can do what's called free play. And in the free play ver uh, portion of the game, when it's not your turn, you are a nation. Therefore, you can form alliances with other players. Oh, wow. and there are, again, very simple rules to the alliances. You can share um, money and you can coordinate actions, but you can't share satellites or ASAT capabilities. The game was designed, um, uh, I, I'm retired Air Force, uh, my PhD is in security engineering. Uh, for the last 20 years, I've taught starting at the Air Force Academy and in the last 15 years with the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. And in that time, I uh, have uh, specialized in developing uh, educational games. And this is just the most recent. And the thing about games, the great thing about games is that the students um, don't have to uh, read anything or learn anything before they come to class. By doing the game, they learn. And the key to reinforcing those lessons is at the end of the game, at the conclusion, we do what's called a debrief. And we say, okay, so here's what you saw in the game and this is how it relates to what's going on in the world today. So we, we do go back and uh, use the uh, experience in the game so that uh, we can reinforce the lessons. So give me just like a real quick rundown of the props here. Okay, so what we have here are the satellites and they are represented in this uh, game by jacks and then we have uh, and the objective of the game is to collect as many of these as possible of course they cost money and here's your money here we are in vegas and you couldn't be in vegas unless you had poker chips <laughs> so um, the red worth three points the blue or two points and the white are one points satellites cost three points a piece Okay. Uh, these are ASAT cards, anti-satellite cards. Those must be expensive. Uh, they are more expensive than cyber cards. Right. Go figure. But are they more effective? Um, they are a one-shot kill, yes. Right. Except um, that's all they can do. 
See, one of the big lessons in this game is not only do a lot of more countries have cyber capabilities, but cyber can span across not just all segments of a space system, ground, space, as well as communications. They can also span and be targeted against uh, all phases of a space system, from initial design until the system is decommissioned, so at any point along the way. Versus anti-satellite capabilities, it's a one-shot, one-kill, but only when your satellite's in orbit. So it's a lot less versatile, a lot less capable than the cyber. So the cyber can not only destroy your satellites, it can also defend against your anti-satellite attacks. It can also steal your neighbor's money, okay? So um, what people focus on typically who um, are familiar with the industry, they focus on the hardware because right. this stuff is cool. Cyber is not cool, okay? But it is just as deadly and if not more effective. And more of a threat. And more of a threat. Oh, yes. Wow. So what do we do about it? What do we do about this threat? <laughs> right now, well, <laughs> cybersecurity is the first step and awareness is the first step to cybersecurity. So um, you have to constantly be vigilant in order to protect uh, your systems. And um, we have we have gone a long way or come a long way in both the industry and also cybersecurity in general that we understand that a lot better today than we did just five years ago and that right. we do a lot more today than we did just five years ago the bottom line is there is no cure for cyber attack you can't prevent it all you can do is be vigilant and take the measures and uh, if you fail to do so then you're setting yourself up for failure if you're reacting it's too late uh, exactly right <laughs> The volume of cislunar space is 218,000 times the volume of Earth. So not only do we want to keep it beautiful, but we also want to keep it safe. I was really looking forward to hearing from Gwen Shotwell, but unfortunately she had to cancel due to personal reasons at the last minute. But we did hear a talk from Jessica Jensen with SpaceX, and it was really interesting. So here is some of that discussion. So this is a picture of the Starship vehicle, our first orbital vehicle, that we are working through a series of static fire tests to get to the first flight. Starship is a fully reusable launch vehicle and space vehicle system that's going to be capable of carrying tons and tons of cargo and crew to interplanetary destinations. That's what we're designing it for in the long run. So as we're working up to this first flight, we're also building a whole fleet of vehicles, a fleet of engines, ships, boosters. And the reason we're doing that is twofold. One, we want to start out very quickly with a rapid flight rate. We want to use test flights and our early Starlink missions to learn and iterate quickly and get to solutions that are going to work for everyone in the future as fast as possible. The other really cool thing about building up to a rapid flight rate very quickly is it ensures that your designs are simple and manufacturable. And what that really translates to for us is lower costs and simplicity. And there's something simple, you know, when you talk about these vehicles, you want, we want vehicles all over the solar system. These vehicles might wind up being bases on the moon or Mars. You want simple systems that are easy to build, easy to repair, easy to fly again. So when I think about sustainability, simplicity is really a key part of it. And I think that will lead to reliability. And then as we talk about what's next for Starship, I actually want to take a little step back. And uh, Pam talked about this a little bit with some of the questions. I really want to elaborate on public-private partnerships and how they can be incredible enablers. So more than 10 years ago, NASA issued a request for proposal for cargo services to the space station. And that was kind of it. It was just like, you know, they need cargo to the space station. They put it out to industry. One of the unique things about it was it only specified requirements for the cargo capabilities and for safety of the space station. The rest was left up to industry. And what's so cool is it brought out an amazing competition. So it developed two vehicles, Dragon and Cygnus, which are actually very different and provide complementary services. And so the like kind of the loose or the, the not so over constraining requirements led to these great vehicles. And then on the SpaceX side, 
that has enabled everything. So Dragon is now carrying commercial crew to the space station, private astronauts to the space station, private astronauts in space, all of that, all of that learning is also gonna be contributing to exploring the solar system. You know, it also enabled a launch vehicle and launch vehicle reuse. And Falcon 9 now supports national security payloads, NASA scientific payloads, telecommunication satellites. And it's so cool to think that basically all of that, you know, with our own internal funding as well, but I really think you know, none of this may have happened if it wasn't for that initial public-private partnership. So I always want to thank NASA for that one because it's really cool. So I think thinking back, everyone should think back to that example and how can we do more of that moving forward into this new regime? The new regime is Moon. So we, SpaceX is just so honored to be a part of um, the Artemis program. And one of the things we're doing is, similar, I talked about Falcon 9 is flying all these commercial missions. So we fly a lot of commercial missions. We also fly government missions. And what that does overall is builds up a flight rate and lets us actually reduce the financial and technical risk to the government. And so that's, we've actually shown that on Falcon 9, and we want to do the same thing for Starship. So basically, we're working on the human landing system. We're working on that in parallel with developing Starlink for commercial, for Starship for commercial capabilities. And we're going to start off by flying Starlinks, and then we're going to incrementally build up the capabilities that it takes to safely land humans on the moon. So I really think this is a good way to do things, and we're super excited about it. Um, the last bit is, how do we go to the moon and stay there and go to farther destinations? And there's a few things that SpaceX is going to work on to help enable all of this. So one, it's so important for all of us to lower the cost of transportation. That is just kind of, uh, that's going to be a huge enabler. So we're going to work really hard at that. I think the industry all wants to work hard at that, but that really is key. Um, reuse and sustainability of vehicles. So when we think about going to the moon, we're also thinking about, you know, landing there, but then having vehicles that, you know, come up, they go back up to the lunar gateway. There's vehicles that hang out in low Earth orbit, propellant depots, there's refueling in orbit. We've really got to think about all this together and how to build, you know, sort of the sustainable um, presence. And the last part is, I think, from the SpaceX side, for sure, we are going to work on we want to be able to deliver significant amounts of cargo and infrastructure for all of these missions. I think that's going to be absolutely essential for letting people live, work, and do research on the moon for long durations. So we're so happy to be a part of all of this and really excited for the future. One of the biggest things that I took is that engineers are not the only thing moving space forward. It's actually policymakers, people in economics, people in business development and coming together will drive us forward to this new space economy. What has been the most interesting talk that you've heard so far? Something related to cybersecurity. I don't really think too much about the threats in space technology, but putting satellites into orbit, uh, there is a lot of threat when you create a lot of nodes, when you put a lot of satellites into space. Uh, other competitor countries can take over and put uh, potential hazards and take information so that's something I never considered. The reason I want to work in this is because it makes natural sense that this is the future of humanity. And what are you doing specifically? I am an astronaut injury biomechanist. I study how astronauts could get injured and uh, I try to make spacecrafts safer for astronauts to fly in. So tell us some stuff about astronaut injury and preventing it, or some stuff that we might not know. Well, much to many people's surprise, you actually get hurt a lot uh, when you land back, especially with um, spacecrafts that look like a probe uh, or capsule. They tend to, uh, even in a normal water landing that goes thump like this, that, that sound itself was impactful enough. Um, it creates enough energy that is transmitted to an astronaut's body that's comparable to a small car crash or a minor car crash. And um, unlike a car crash that happens once every few million miles driven in the United States, the probability of landing is 100%. Right. So we're trying to make sure that uh, an astronaut not only is not injured, 
but they are able to self egress from the spacecraft and they're able to carry out their mission that they've trained very hard for. What about for these like long duration missions? I know that they can really impact like the health of an astronaut. So what what do you think is key moving forward for us to be able to keep humans healthy on longer missions to Mars, for example? What do we got to solve for? There are a lot of problems ranging from the psychological to the physiological. Um, I shall only speak on the area that I have experience in. And uh, the biggest issue that I am most concerned about is muscle atrophy and bone deconditioning because we don't want them to land uh, completely osteopenic, if not osteoporotic, because that could seriously jeopardize their ability to carry out their mission. So the mission integrity could get compromised. And uh, as best as we currently understand space, or, uh, space orthopedics, um, the three um, remedies that we have in place is to work out, is to have a balanced diet, <laughs> and to have uh, pharmacological interventions such as inhibitors that keep the bone from um, deconditioning. Wow, minus that last one, that's basically what they tell us to do here on Earth. <laughs> Most people still can't Just stay healthy, folks. <laughs> yes. And you guys are working on Orion, correct? Yes, so Orion is our capsule. Lockheed Mil Martin built and developed it. Um, that's one of my focus areas, actually. Yep. I spent a very long time on Orion before I entered business development. Uh, about 13 years and so needless to say it's very exciting to have the launch coming up soon um, we're, we're really anxious to get it off the ground it's the next thing it's the uh, only human certified deep space exploration vehicle right now and so we're really excited to get it going and do Artemis 2 with a crew on it you know the Orion capsule looks similar to Apollo but describe the differences that we don't see it's a little bit smaller but the biggest difference is that technology inside of course you know, we have uh, far more advanced computers than they could ever have hoped to have. Um, a lot of our sensors have gone through excess, you know, great evolutions from GPS to the IMUs to the, uh, to the LIDARs that we use. Uh, all of those things are uh, new technologies that far surpass anything Apollo had. It's an exciting time for us, right? With, with Orion being the, the exploration vehicle, uh, part of the Artemis program, um, it's it's going to take us back to the moon. It's going to get those uh, get give us the uh, capability that we haven't had in a very long time. Um, also, you know, when you look at Orion, there's a lot of technologies that are there that are going to be extensible to uh, future missions with Mars in mind. Um, and Lockheed is excited to be a part of all of that. How many people are going to fit on the Orion capsule? Um, we can f have a crew of four on there, and uh, comfortably comfortably being relative. It's still a small capsule as all space vehicles tend to be. It's been a long time coming, but uh, that's okay. You know, when you do things that are big endeavors in space, it's always challenging. It always takes longer than you think it will at the beginning, but you have to have the focus on um, crew safety and making sure that everything's perfect. You don't, you don't get to make mistakes when it comes to space flight. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people are really excited about Artemis, but there's also a lot of criticism about the delays and the budget and yeah. like, uh, like I said, you know, it's, there's a lot of factors that come into play. Um, there's a lot of really large components that are involved, from the SLS that's going to take us up there to the Orion, um, both the crew module and the service module. And uh, it's just a matter of making sure that you take the time to do it right. Okay, Ellie in Space here with Patrick O'Neill. And you gave a presentation today, so tell people a little bit what your role is to talk about here at Ascend. Yeah, so uh, Patrick O'Neill, I am the Public Affairs and Outreach uh, Lead for the International Space Station National Laboratory. I have the uh, express privilege of working alongside a lot of researchers that are doing R&D on the space station, but also communicating why they're doing that. Uh, why microgravity? How does that impact uh, the R&D? And how can we translate that R&D back here to life on Earth? And so the session that we are focused on today at Ascend was uh, commercial partners that are using the space station not only for R&D, but also communicating the value of doing R&D in space for, for the consumers and just to, to excite the general public about the types of things that you can do 
in low earth orbit. And let's excite the general public by listing off some of those. Oh gosh, uh, well, uh, so one of the reasons why you'd want to do research in space is because you have access to continuous microgravity. Uh, one of the things that we have here on, on Earth is that we are constantly held down by gravity. So what if you were to take science to a different realm? It's almost like going from like a 3D to now having this fourth dimension uh, that you're able to leverage. And by doing so, you're really able to look at a myriad of scientific applications. Uh, what's also cool about the space station is the unique vantage point of it, uh, where it covers 90%, I want to say, of Earth's habitable environment over the course of any one day. And that's different from a lot of other traditional satellites where they don't, they're not able to encompass that much, uh, that much volume over the course of a day. And then lastly is the extreme environment. Uh, not only are you able to do research inside of the space station, but you could also do research on the outside of the space station, where you have temperature variation spikes, you have uh, atomic oxygen, you have radiation levels that are that are uh, heightened from what it is that you have inside of the space station. So by doing stuff on the outside of the space station, you can literally say we are testing it in the most rigorous environments imaginable. Let's talk about that kind of ongoing transition right now from the ISS to something else in, in the future and what what you think about that? So as of right now, the International Space Station is slated to remain in orbit through 2030. But what NASA is also doing is they're making the investment into uh, the next generation of space station or space stations. Uh, so commercial LEO destinations is what we are calling them. As of right now, NASA has allocated uh, awards for four different uh, concepts. Uh, and, and so the, the thought being that you know, eventually NASA could be one of many customers that is able to leverage a space station in low Earth orbit, as opposed to on this particular space station, we as the taxpayers of the United States are really kind of uh, ensuring the viability of the space station. But again, hopefully we will now pass over some of that to the private sector. Uh, and again, NASA, as well as a lot of the international partners can eventually take advantage of these commercial LEO destinations in low Earth orbit. It, 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 sometimes it seems as though space communicators are almost kind of talking in a bubble, like an echo chamber. How are we able to kind of get outside of that? And, and I thought it was a fantastic question because uh, one of the things that has happened is we're launching so much so frequently now that in some ways uh, it does kind of diminish our ability to really talk about the exciting things that are happening. It's almost as though it's sensory overload. So uh, it's really important for us to not only engage with mainstream media, but also to really work alongside influencers and those that are interested in talking about space. And, and, and that's, that's a great way for us to be able to really get people excited uh, so that that way the people that are consuming uh, this type of material, they're already interested in what's happening in low Earth orbit. So now let's just give them more information and, and get people more excited. And eventually that will be something that becomes popularized and it goes out to the masses. What's really fun about the ISS National Lab is it opens up access and opportunity for R&D companies that maybe traditionally might not have been associated with doing stuff in low Earth orbit. And so, you know, we've had the chance to work with entities like Budweiser. Uh, I'm wearing Adidas shoes right now. Adidas launched multiple investigations to the space station uh, trying to improve the foundations of its boost technology. Uh, and, and so those are really fun because those are recognizable companies that are brands, but at the same time we get to tell fun stories and, and get people excited about doing R&D in space. But on top of that, we also work alongside more traditional types of entities like the National Science Foundation, National Institutes of Health. So it really does, it's a, it's a wide swath, if you will, of, of the types of collaborations that are possible on the space station, ranging from fundamental research to applied research to advancing technologies in low Earth orbit and also furthering business models in space. The vast majority of students that are in college right now have never lived a day where there has not been someone living in working in space. And I think that when people take a step back and realize the ingenuity that has gone into the development and the sustainability of this particular space station and the benefits that has brought to all of us from R&D as well as just the general excitement of being in space, uh, I think people are really surprised when they realize we've been doing this for a very long time. It's not just a technical conference. The fact that you have people from very different verticals all assembling here. You have people from Space Force, you have uh, policy leaders, and you have um, the ones who have the funds to make it happen. Someone uh, who I was working with told me about um, Ascend, the fact that there's gonna be a lot of people from her company here. And the more I read into it, the more I realized that I'll be missing out by not showing up here. Uh, our experience at Ascend has been terrific. Uh, it's great having all the movers and shakers of industry talking about what's happening and what the trends are, especially we're here to hear the latest from NASA and STMD. STMD has been incredibly important for Transaster through the NIAC program. Um, and it's been great also meeting with potential business partners and customers um, and just uh, 
socializing and greasing the skids for lots of future business. To see the, um, I'll say the future of the workforce, that at one point I used to come to these conferences and I was on that end of it and I had so much energy and enthusiasm that I see even doubled here. Um, and, and what the potential of things being discussed here. It's, it's gone beyond, you know, how can we improve a, 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 a rocket propellant that's used every day to uh, uh, taking care of cislunar space and sustainability, themes that make, make me know that the space uh, pursuits are gonna go on for years. So it's, it's energizing for me. We were here last year. I personally was not here last oh. year. So this is my first time around. Um, it's great. The, uh, the sessions have been excellent so far. I like the diversity. I like some of the focus areas. Um, new areas in the industry for people to start talking about, which is great. Tons of nuclear sessions, which are very interesting. Um, yeah, and a lot of diversity in the panels. The only downside is there's so many that you can't go to all of them. Yes, yeah. that's a good point. Yeah. And it looks like we have like a, a lot of young students here too. So like why is you know, this is so important to uh, get, get everyone involved, not just people that are established in the industry. It's the next generation, so it's so important. There's such a, um, I won't call it a shortage, but there's certainly not enough people entering the industry at this point. Our needs are outgrowing, but it, or the demand is outgrowing the uh, supply. So having students here, getting them involved, having them um, not only be a part of the sessions listening, but many of you have their own sessions that they're presenting at. Um, it's fantastic. Okay, so Anna, tell me like what your favorite thing has been so far here at Ascend. Oh, the networking with like awesome professionals in the field. It's just mind-blowing. And the opportunity to talk to so many people that have been contributing to the industry set the tone to where we are now and very likely also setting the path for where we are going next is just awesome. <laughs> Yeah, and I know we're only on day two, but what has been your favorite session so far? Mm, the nuclear talk yesterday between leaders in the industry was really awesome, uh, but also the uh, accelerating um, space growth with uh, international collaboration was very um, eye-opening to what's going on throughout the world, not only efforts from the U.S., but also from very other countries and showing how like what we are now is a result of many countries working together right. and that the future is really set by an industry that's um, very um, led by this collaboration between different nations with different expertise and uh, in the end we are all together in this planet absolutely and you're a diversity scholar so tell me a little bit more about that and what that means to you that means a great opportunity. Being a diversity scholar have, has given me the chance to talk to so many people, super great, like um, Jim Free, former director of NASA Glenn, um, Ellen Yoshua, NASA astronaut, and so many other leaders, um, having the time to really sit down and pick their brains on their expertise and life as a whole. So it's been great being a diversity scholar. Oh, hey, it's inspirational, right? Having a whole space community get together and talk about doing things like off-Earth uh, economies and landing back on the moon, it's inspiring. That's, that's kind of my takeaway, just being around people that are inspired to go do something big. Well, aside from uh, being overjoyed at uh, receiving a nice, nice award, um, I've been uh, listening to the panel discussion where there were representatives from five different countries talking about what their space programs are doing and it was lovely to get that wide of a perspective on what's going on in our industry. Oh my goodness, well, each day has brought so many interactions that we just couldn't have anticipated. I think my favorite, if I had to put it in word, is two words. The volume of people here, the number of people here, and just the opportunities for face-to-face -face interactions, person-to-person -person conversations that we just can't have in any other forum as productively as we can here. That, that part has been inspiring and productive and in encouraging and engaging and leading to all kinds of follow-up with our own organizations that we will take with us as we go back home. Great. I mean, what, like, what a group of people and also what a group of speakers. What has been oh your my favorite goodness. talk so far? You know, I don't think it's, I, for a lot to say all of them, uh, they've all just been uh, out of this world, if you will. Uh, enjoyed the summit ballrooms, of course, the, the big picture views, but even the technical forums have had topics that are, that are, that are just spectacular. So uh, 
Uh, our, our only uh, regret is just not being able to bring as many people here as we want to. And we're hoping that's going to change next year in Houston. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Perfect. There's so much potential in space today that, that is greater than it's ever been. Opportunities to work and think, and it's not just being an engineer or a scientist, it's, it's also how you get involved to be a visionary. You know, what do you think of when you, um, uh, when you think of the moon? I talked about lava tubes, you know, to me that's fascinating and I'm, I'm a space geek, um, but, but there's, there's so much more for artists to do um, than today. And even the basic two-year degree that people can get and, and make an incredible living working on space hardware every day, um, it spans that and of course education. I think uh, I always want people to come back to what we do is about education and inspiring people. All right, everyone, so that is a wrap here at Ascend. We have had three days packed with information here in Vegas. Over 400 speakers and over 1,100 people on site. So I have really enjoyed this opportunity, not just to sit through some of the interesting discussions, but also a lot of the networking opportunities here. So if you weren't able to make it this year, of course, there will be another one next October. So hopefully you'll be able to join me then but until then, I just want to say a big thanks to AIAA for this opportunity and inviting me to be here. And I hope that you enjoyed meeting some of the fun, interesting people in this video. And I'll see you in the next one. I'm here at Ascend, so there. <laughs> um, so, um, okay. Okay, three, two, stop. No, I got it, I got it. Three, two, one. All right, goes. <laughs> okay, three.